Thank you, ladies. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So we're beginning a new series today. It's called Praise and Worship and Awareness. And I'm going to set some people free in relation to the issue of worship. If you come here, you, should, you can worship God with how, any way you want in relation to the Word of God. You, you can worship God with your hands lifted. Amen. You can worship with your hands down. All I ask you is you lift your hands, please lift your heart first. Amen. Okay? Worship begins in the heart. I had a brother, a friend of mine, that he was one of the most he was a powerful man of God and one of the mentors of my life. And I, only, I was in service with him many, many times. I only saw him raise his hands one time. And, and the Lord just told me, he said, don't worry about his hands, worry about the heart. Amen. You know, God looks at the heart, he ain't looking at your hands. So you're free to lift your hands, you're free to sit on your hands. But I'm believing that the worship is powerful enough you'll want to lift your hands. Paul talks about lifting holy hands in Timothy. And so you're welcome to do whatever the Spirit of God leads you. If you get out of line, we got a guy back there. He'll come with a big hook, drag you out, and, and we'll, straight, we'll straighten you out. But I want to look at some scripture before we get into the Word. But I, I, I'm going to set you free about worship and understanding what worship is and how you can worship continually. You know, that, that's an amazing thing that the God would ask us to worship Him continually. Lord, I, I got to work. I got to make a living. Gotta, I, got, I got stuff to do, Lord. So let's look at some scripture and see, see what we're exhorted to do by scripture. Let's see. David says in Psalm 24, 1, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and the world and they that dwell in there. And this is where worship starts, of understanding who owns everything. Yes, yes. This is so important that you understand this. The earth is the Lord's. God did not give Adam ownership. He gave him stewardship. So Satan couldn't steal the earth. He stole dominion, which Adam gave him, but he didn't steal the earth. Say with me, the earth is the Lord's. The earth is the Lord's. So that makes God my source of everything in my life. Amen. That makes God my source. Amen. Now you know the beginning of worship starts right here. Knowing that God is our source. So the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And the world and they that are dwell in there. God says, you're mine. You're mine. Let's see what else David described to the Lord. He said, I will bless the Lord at all times. Everybody say all times. All times. David, come on. I got to make a living. I got to pay rent. I got to pay bills. And his praise shall continually, not just on Sunday, be in my mouth. Amen? Yes, amen. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord, and the humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Let's go back to verse 1, though. I will bless the Lord at all times. Man, how, how, Lord, how do I accomplish that? I'm going to tell you today. I'm going to tell you in this series. All right, so let's go to the, our next reading here. Hebrews 13, 15. Okay, now the writer of Hebrews. And you can argue whether it's Paul or whoever it's Paul. Trust me. I, I, some say Apollos, but I say Paul. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God on Sunday. Always. Continually, continually. Everybody say continually. And that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to God. So I want to go back up there and see this word sacrifice. You know, sometimes you don't feel like praising God. I'll be honest with you. There's some days I, you know, I'd rather sit there and watch a hunting show. I mean, I'll be honest with you. But the sacrifice of praise, sometimes you've got to make your flesh praise God. It's a sacrifice. Sometimes it is a sacrifice to praise God. I don't always feel like it. I don't always feel like coming to church, but I do. Well, you come to pastor. You have to come to church, Pastor Steve. No, I don't. <laughs> she makes me come to church, so that's how I get here. <laughs> it wasn't for her. There'd be some days I'd be off doing some other stuff, but I, God gave me a wife, a helpmate. <laughs> so everybody say the sacrifice of praise. Sacrifice and you know, that, that, that's important to God. David says, I won't give anything to God that doesn't cost me something. Even my praise. Even my worship. What else do we got, guys? Oh, James 1.17. This is Jesus' half-brother. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Everybody say good, good. gift. Yes. And every perfect gift. Every perfect gift. So there are good gifts from God and there are perfect gifts from God. I'm not going to get to that today, but I'm going to get to that in, the series. in this series. What's the difference between a good gift and a perfect gift? So every good and perfect gift. So everything you have that's good, everything you have that's perfect in your life, Where's it, where's it come from? It's come from above and cometh down from the Father. Every good thing you have right now is from God. 
So you got a lot of material to praise God with. How many got down here in a car? Could you imagine a hundred years ago having to, having to get your horses and uh, hook them up to a team and, and driving five miles to a church? A missionary friend of mine in Africa, he said they walk eight miles to church. And they bring their lunch with them, which is a live chicken to church. And after church, they have a potluck. <laughs> and the chicken's in trouble. Every good and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So every good thing I have, every wonderful thing I have, the gas in my car is from God. Wow. Is that the end of our reading today, guys? There's a quote here. Yeah, and I, I think that this is uh, Charles Spurgeon. Uh, anybody know who Charles Spurgeon is? When we praise God for our mercies, we usually prolong them. When we praise God in our miseries, we usually end them. Oh, I love this. Praise is the honey of life. Honey of life. And, and I, I, who, who out there is preaching on me? Now, be careful. I, I'm the preacher here. So praise is the honey of life, which a devout heart extracts. In other words, a devout heart understands the honey in the rock. And we're going to get to that later on in the series. From every bloom. Everybody say every bloom. Every bloom. The devout heart understands everything you have is from God. In the providence and grace of our Lord. So that's Charles Spurgeon. So he knew a little bit about God. He knew a little bit about grace. He knew a little bit about praise and worship. So David tells us, sing unto the Lord a new song. And we all think that that means, well, go in your room and, and, and you know, get, get motivated by some of your pastor or whatever, or music, and you, you write a new song. That's not what David's talking about. And right now, we, 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 we leave all the praise in the new songs to worship and worship leaders. And right now in America, what we have is a lot of the worship is worshiping the worship. And sometimes, even now, we see there's worship of worship leaders. And I want to talk about that in a little bit here. So when your song comes, becomes more important than the one you're singing to, when your song becomes more important than the one you're singing to, then the entire worship experience is negated. I'm going to tell you what God hates. I'm going to tell you exactly two things God hates. And it starts with the first two commandments. Thou shall have no other gods before me. And then he says, and I don't want you to make any idols or graven images. So, so God's serious about his, our attention to him and who he is. Any other worship other than God is idolatry. Okay, now I'm going to get a little bit deeper into that. That might be your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your spouse, your son, your daughter. And in America, it's actors and actresses and athletes. You know, your job can be an idol. I found that out in my life. Do you know your hobbies can be an idol? Your hobbies can become an idol. In fact, I remember years ago when, when I began to hunt and my dad taught me how to hunt. And he said, I son, he said, son, I see you're really taken to this. He said, I see that this has become important to you. But he said, do not let it become a God or an idol in your life. Whatever has more worth than God is an idol. God detests idolatry. And whether you like it or not, this is non-negotiable with your God. God hates idolatry. How, how many of you men would like, like uh, sharing your wife with three or four other men? God said, I'm not sharing you with anybody. You're mine. I'm trying to make a point here so you understand. Get, get that nastiness out of your mind. God said, I'm not sharing you with anybody. You're mine. And he said, idolatry indicates to him that you are not. So, God hates this kind of stuff. And idolatry before God is really spiritual adultery. So anyone you ascribe anything on earth to, and they receive it, they allow it, and they accept it, they are competing with God. little thing called American Idol. <laughs> and I can tell you that's dangerous, and they're in danger. Ascribing something to yourself is dangerous. If somebody comes up to you and they, they say, oh, you're a great singer, and you're, you're, you're so talented, you better be careful how you respond. Think before you respond. Don't put yourself in competition with Jesus Christ. Don't put yourself in danger of ascribing and taking and receiving praise. Oh, I've been told many times, you know, oh, Pastor Steve, that was a great sermon. And you'll never hear me say, oh, yes and amen, bless God. God has anointed me. You'll hear the truth. It's not me. It's by His grace. It's not me. Say, it's not me. It's by His grace. So you remember uh, King Nebuchadnezzar? Anybody know that story from the Bible? 
God came to him and God made him king. God told him, I'm going to bless your kingdom. The problem is, Nebi, you know Nebi. <laughs> he began to think it was him. He began to ascribe it to him. He began to ascribe it to himself and he started thinking, I'm God. All this is because of my wisdom and my knowledge. And my leadership, and he began to be go, boast in all that he had accomplished that he thought was by himself. And God came and he said, Nebi, I was being so nice to you. <laughs> and you go and you take what I have ascribed and given unto you, and now you're ascribing it unto yourself. And we all know what Nebuchadnezzar did. God came and spoke, and, and he kicked him out of the kingdom, and he ended up eating grass like an animal for seven years. Grew hair like a dog. And even after he straightened up, he came back, it happened again. He got boastful, and he lost his kingdom. He thought he was Frank Sinatra. He did it my way. It's all me. And God said, no, I, I'm going to let you know something. Let me tell you something. This is important. It's okay for people to praise you, but never receive it. Don't accept it. Keep passing it on to Jesus. Amen. Never receive it. Never accept it. Keep passing it on to Jesus Christ. Oh, pastor, that's a great sermon. I'll tell you, yeah, it's, it's because of Jesus Christ. Amen. It's because of His Holy Spirit. So you have to keep passing on. Never allow anybody to do that to you. Keep passing it on. So it is so important to understand this of, Lord, I don't have anything except from you, by you, or through you. So it's going to shock you whether you believe it or not. If you tell somebody, oh, that's wonderful singing. That's wonderful singing. And they pass it on to Jesus Christ. That's called worship. That's worship. Amen. I thought worship was lifting my hands and jumping and dancing. And saying, no, anything you ascribe to God is worship to God. Amen. So whatever you ascribe to God is worship to Him. Amen. So I can describe anything to God where somebody has said something to me and I say, no, it's not me, it's all God. Right, yeah. The reality is, who are you ascribing your success or your talent or your ability to? The reality is, if you study the life of Jesus Christ to live the most perfect life in the history of the world, the only man that ever lived a perfect life, and what do we find in Jesus? He said, I don't do anything except for what I see the Father do. That's right. That's right. I, don't, I don't say anything except for what I hear the Father say. Amen. Hold it, this is Jesus. This, this is Emmanuel, God with us. But what is Jesus doing? He's ascribing everything that he does to the Father. Right. Even Jesus said, I pass it on to the Father. Amen. I said, listen, understand, even Jesus understood, I'm going to pass this on. And this was the power thing that Jesus had in his ministry. He let all the glory go to the Father. And so in our lives, when we let all the glory go to the Father, it's a place of power in the kingdom of God. Amen. That protected him, enabled him to operate in the power of God. He said, I only do the works that the Father sows me. I only do the works that the Father allows me to do. He kept transferring the credit to God. You know, the danger of success is this. You taking and receiving the credit and allowing others to ascribe and give it to you. And the dangerous thing is you accepting it. As if you did it and you deserve it. Now you're in trouble with God. I, I know you're great and I know you're talented and I know you're wonderful. But I, I'm going to tell you all that gifting comes from God. Every good and perfect gift comes from who? God. So, so it says not you. It's not you. It's not you. It's not you. I don't care how talented you are. God said it's from me. That's right. The reality is when you accept that you are now competing with God. You are now letting people worship you. The problem with letting people worship you is you will begin to worship you. No, get me wrong. Jesus praised, praised people. Remember what he told the centurion, Roman centurion? He said, I've never seen such great faith in Israel. But what did the Roman centurion say? He, he said, no, you don't need to come to my house. He said, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a man who lives under authority. And understand, he said, this is by the authority that has come from God the Father. And he understood exactly how, how that worked. So if somebody praises you, you must always transfer that praise to God. You know, that's what made David successful with Goliath. Mm -hmm. yeah. David told Goliath, he said, you come to me with a sword and a shield and a spear. And he didn't run up there and say, hey man, I'm coming to you as the best swing man in all of Israel. You messing with the wrong Marine. You couldn't believe what I, you can't believe what I'm out, I can do with this. You can believe my talent and how much ability I have with this swing. In fact, he didn't even mention the swing. All he said is, I come to you in the name of the Lord, the host of the God of Israel. And God said, that's what I want, David. That's what I want right there. 
you, you're, you're giving all the praise. Even before God performs that, God says, you're starting with who the, who the, who the power comes from. It comes from God. That a boy, David, he said, I'm about to make your swing the most famous swing in the history of mankind. So even David said, I'm not going to boast in my ability. I'm going to boast in the ability of my God. Amen. Never even mentioned a sling. So as people and the human nature we have, sometimes it feels good to people to build you up and tell you, hey, that's a good sermon. But I can tell you right now, Every pastor I know, and most pastors I know that's worth his weight in, in the kingdom of God goes home knowing if God hadn't done something, there wouldn't even been a service today. Right. If God hadn't showed up, there wouldn't even been a service today. We have to have praise and worship to get God to show up so I can even get up here. So that's what made David successful. It all starts with God. So be careful what you start talking about. I remember I heard, I heard a frame, very famous sermon from my pastor, and he was talking about the children of Israel and how they always went around and they always boasted that they were God's favorite people. We're the children of God. We have, we have Abraham. We have Moses. We have, you, you Gentiles don't have anybody. And if you look through their 5,000 years of history, how, how did that go of boasting that they had God and the rest of us didn't have anything? Be careful what you boast about yourself in God. Be careful what you say about yourself. Don't compete with God and don't compete with Jesus Christ. God is saying, David, I'm so excited about that. So now I'm going to get deeper into this. Worship is only possible through the knowledge of the one being worshipped. You will only worship Jesus Christ to the level that you know him. You cannot worship beyond what you know about the person you are worshipping. Your worship, worship is limited to the knowledge of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. And I believe that's why we end up worshiping things. Because we know more about people and things than we do the God who gave us those things. So, we worship what we know. You any, ever see anybody worship their car? Men? I, I, I've... Growing up with guys that had trucks, and, and literally they, they worshiped their trucks. And I, I mean, literally, they gave that truck more love than they gave their wife or their kids or anybody else in their life. I, I, I don't know what the gals do, but I know with guys, it's, it's trucks. And, and I'll, I'll give you one for guys, it's guns. <laughs> oh, you should see my gun collection. But I, I, I grew up with a guy that had a really nice truck, and, and it's like, man, that guy's in love with his truck. That poor girlfriend, bless her heart. <laughs> And I'll tell you what's worshiping, what you know is, is when Jesus met the Samaritan woman, he told her this, you don't even know what you worship. He said, you're worshiping what you don't even know. And my question to you today as a believer, do you understand who you're worshiping? Do you understand who he is, what he's done, and the power that he has done, and that he has wrought in the earth, and what he's done for your life in eternity? Do you know who you're worshiping today? Do you know him? That's my question. And that's heaven's question to you. If you want to receive, if God wants to receive the worship from you, he needs to know that the worship is legitimate. Yes. Can you imagine Jesus telling you, you don't even know what you're worshiping? Do you know that every test and trial we go through, that God is giving you material to worship him with? Anybody in this room have a testimony of God, the goodness of God in your life? That's material for you to worship him with. That's material for you to worship him with. I remember one time years ago, one of the, one of the praise and worship leaders, and this years and years ago, he, he said, well, you know, he said, Pastor Steve, after five minutes, I don't know what to worship God for. <laughs> I, I honestly, I, I didn't have an answer for that. I, I said, well, brother, I said, you need some teaching. So I'm going to tell you today what you have and all the things you have to worship God for. Wow, every test and trial in my life is material for me to worship my God. You know, God didn't keep the three Hebrew boys out of the fire. God let them go into the fire. Why? He didn't give them some worship material. He let them go in that fire and find out, you know what? My God is a consuming fire. And my, the fire of my God consumed the fire of Nebuchadnezzar. And they found out that their God's fire could quench the fire of man. And they came out and they had a song unto the Lord now. They had a testimony. And they say, let me tell you what my God can do. He's inflammable. You can't burn him up. You can't scorch him out. How do you know? Because I went through the fire with him. Now I got a worship song. Now I got some praise and I got some worship material. And it's going to last forever and ever and ever. 
So you think the tests and trials you go through, I'm going to tell you, God just giving you worship material. Start praising me in the test. Start praising me in the storm. He's giving you some material to work with. But I'm going to tell you why I'm worshiping, because I know who my God is, and he's taking me through the fire. So every test and trial, think about it, is God introducing himself to you in a new way. What did Jesus tell the disciples? He said, get on the boat. We're going to go to the other side. <laughs> That's what Jesus said. Get on the boat. We're going to go to the other side. He didn't tell them there was going to be a storm along the way. But the word of God was, get on the boat. We're going to the other side. And what happened is they got there and got in the middle of the storm. And pretty soon they were, they were just freaking out. And they were just, oh, Jesus, help us, help us, help us. Yep. The, the word of the Lord was, we're going to go to the other side. Right. The word of the Lord to you today is God's going to take you through the other side. Yeah. So yes, you might be in a test, you might be in a trial, but the reality is God's giving you some worship material because he's taking you through it. Say, God's giving me worship material. So God introduces himself in, to us in a new way. And many times in that, it gives us a song. Can I tell you that God's name is I am that I am? Yes. I am. What does that mean? I am whatever you need. I am whatever you need. I, tell you, I have found out God's a good doctor. Amen. I found out God's a good businessman. Amen. I have found out that God's an amazing realtor. Yes. I have found out that God is amazing with wisdom and knowledge and revelation of how to be a husband, how to be a father, even how to be a pastor. I am that I am, Stephen. I, I am everything you need. You know, God's even a good banker. And from all these things, God is just giving us more worship material. So many times people will see people. You ever seen people dancing and shouting to the Lord and you wonder, what's wrong with him, people? And I'll, I'll tell you, if you talk to them, they'll tell you, you don't know what I've been through. You don't know my story. You don't know the material I got to worship my God. I bet you if I talk to everybody in this room, you've gone through things that you just can't believe that the God was merciful and gracious and he got you through it. And he got you to it. And you're here today because God was merciful. And now you got a song. Now you have praise and worship material unto God. Do you know every time God rebuked the children of Israel, he always reminded them of this. He said, don't you remember when I came and I rescued you out of Egypt? He said, don't you remember when I put the blood on the head, you put the blood on the doorpost and the death angel passed away? Don't you remember when I took you through the Red Sea? Don't you remember when I got manna and fed you with manna from heaven, the food of angels? Don't you remember when you had a fire by day, a fire by night, cloud by day? He said, don't you remember what I did for you? Don't you remember the manna that fell every day? You complained about the manna, so I sent you a quail. God said, I've given you enough worship material to last for 25, 30, 40, 50, 100 years. In fact, God is still bragging about what he did to the children of Israel today. Say, God's given me worship material. Then start worshiping with it. He's given you a song. Say, I got worshiping material. God always reminded him, don't you remember what I did? That's worshiping material. Quit complaining and whining. David was a great worshiper in Scripture. But a lot of us forget that Saul tried to kill David 21 times. 21 times Saul tried to kill David. And he never succeeded. That's worship material. Now, now I can understand David sitting down and writing some pretty heavy-duty worship to God. That joker tried to kill me and God got me out again. That joker tried to mess with me and God got me out again. And God got me out again. And I'm here to tell you God can get you out again. It's worship material. No wonder David could sing praises unto God. Bear came and God helped David with a bear. Lion came and God helped David with a lion. No wonder he was such a worshiper. The Lord tells us in, in Scripture that sing unto the Lord a new song. And a lot of times we think that's, that's just write a song. That's a command. That's not write a song. The way you get a new song from the Lord is through experience with the Lord. Not, hey, you know, I'm going to sit down at my desk and write God a hit. That, that's not what God is talking about. So if you have no new experience with God, it's hard to write a new song. Right now the church is full of professional songwriters. And they're writing songs out of emotion, but not out of experience. You want to really read amazing worship. Read, read some of the greatest preachers that's ever, that have ever preached. That's why David said, this new song of the Lord, it doesn't come from your head. It comes from your heart. Yeah. It doesn't come from your head. <laughs> right, got a hit. <laughs> and that's what's happening in many things in the church today, many situations. The reality is, have you had a new song in years or no? It's based on an experience with God. Do you know God wants to have experiences with you? Yes, 
Those that know their God, Daniel says, they shall do exploits. Everybody say exploits. That's experiences. It doesn't say the people that know about their God. It says the people that know their God in an intimate way. He said, they're going to have experiences with God. They'll never run out of praise and worship material. They'll always be worshiping God because they have a new song and a new experience with God all the time. So let me ask you, do you have a new song unto the Lord? Maybe you need to stretch your faith and, and step out into something God's asking you to do. Maybe we need to stretch your faith in the church and start taking stuff to that, that home over there. When David says, write a new song, he's just singing a new song. He, he, he said, what's your experience? What's your song? Do you have a song? I know, just like the song I talk about, Majesty. That is not Roy Field's song. Yes, he sings and he does an amazing job at it, but that is Jack Hayford's song. A pastor who went to England and he saw the pomp and circumstance and he said, that's what needs to happen in the church. That when Jesus Christ comes into the church, when praise and worship starts, the people need to stand up and realize the king is walking in. They'll stand up for the queen in England, but they won't stand up for the God of creation when he comes into the church. He inhabits the praises of people. That's where that song came. It got generated out of that experience. And he said, when we start church, we will stand and we will worship the king and honor him as he comes in. You know, if you're in a room and the king or queen of England walks in and you sit down, some joker will come over and he will straighten you out and stand you up. That's a fact. He will stand you up. How dare you not worship royalty? The reality is we sing about going through the water and the flood, but have you ever been there? Have you gone through the flood with him? Or are you singing someone else's song? David's saying, write your own song. What are you and God doing? What exploits are you and God doing? Tell your neighbor, I have a new song. I have a new song. I'm going to do some exploits with God. I, I, I'm going to start singing my new song. And the reality is, as a believer, you don't need a worship leader or a cheerleader to get worship started. Worship is only possible based on the knowledge of the one you're worshiping. And it's hard to call great if you've never experienced it in greatness. So you see, sing a song without experience is called repetition. We sing the songs of David, but we've never killed a giant, maybe. Do you remember how Moses got his first song? It's called the Song of Moses. It's in Exodus. And the reality is got co-opted by his sister Miriam, but the song was written by Moses. Read the Bible. Miriam co-opted that song. But as soon as God let the sea close back in on Pharaoh, and it crashed down on the armies of Pharaoh, and Pharaoh and all his armies were destroyed, Moses sang a new song. This is Moses' song. Moses didn't look at that and say, man, I'm going to write a hit for God now. Uh-huh. Praise God. I will sing unto the Lord. Ooh, that's, that's a good start. No, from his heart with an experience with the living God, he wrote a song that is still powerful today. But that's Moses' song. It's not Miriam's song. What song are you writing with God today? I will sing unto the Lord, he said, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and rider thrown into the sea. Anybody know that song? Praise God. Three or four of you, praise God, we're going to have to sing that song. But he wrote a song out of experience, not out of an emotion. Those that know their God and love him, they shall do exploits. He goes on to say, the Lord is my strength and he's become my salvation. He's my God. I will praise him. My father's God and I will extol him. Praise God. What, what an amazing thing to have an experience with God and then write something like that. The problem is his sister was, I can make a hit out of that. That, that was the issue. You ever, you ever had a financial situation go right to the end and, and then God made a way. He wants he want no, you to know he's the way maker. And now you got a new thing and more material to worship him with. Oh, God, I thank you. Anybody in this room ever been to the end or in a situation where if God doesn't do it, it's not going to happen? If God doesn't show up, this thing might fail. And God showed up, praise God, right at the last minute. I don't know why he loves the last minute moment, but he does. <laughs> He's never late, but he misses a lot of times to be early. I know that. You know, just because you're going through something does not mean that God is not with you. That's right. That's right. Many saints misunderstand this. I had a brother tell me one time, oh, God just waiting to beat me up. I'm like, what? <laughs> what Bible are you reading? <laughs> My goodness. Just because you're going through a hard time, it doesn't mean that God has, has abandoned you. God allowed Daniel to go into the lion's den. And the reality is Daniel went in the lion's den with the lion of the tribe of Judah. And out of that, Daniel got some amazing worship material and praise material. 
And what Daniel found out is, I can sleep and lay down and use a lion for a pillow because the lion of the tribe of Judah is my God and he's standing here beside me. And man, they're going to write songs about this one forever. So anytime you, you sing that song, Daniel says, that's my song. No man in history had ever been in a situation where he was thrown into a den of hungry lions. Because that's the way it was worked back then. You threw, you threw the people, you or the king threw the people he was mad at into a den of hungry lions. And Daniel's down there and the lions are realizing he ain't alone. He's not in this by himself. Not sure what that visage is, but it looks like a lion and he goes a lot better and meaner than we are. Don't you know you're going through it with the lion of the tribe of Judah? And the lion that the enemy sends about you, the Bible says he goes around as a roaring lion. Everybody say, as a roaring lion. And you're going through with the lion, who is Jesus Christ, the lion. So his roaring lion, who's pretend, and Jesus Christ, who's real, guess what? I tell you who's going to win. If you read that story, you'll find out that all the enemies of Daniel, when it was all said and done, Darius came, he said, my God, he said, you're alive. He said, your God is truly God. And they had a worship service. But Darius, when he got all the people that came against Daniel, he threw them in the lion's den. There are some things that the enemy has meant for you that God will spare you and get you out and the enemy will deal with it. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So just lift your hands and thank him. You have a God-facing lion today. That you serve the lion of the tribe of Judah today. So whatever lion you're facing, your lion is bigger and better and stronger. Paul and Silas were in prison one night. Hallelujah. And the lion they were facing that was a beating the next morning. But they started praising and worshiping the lion of the tribe of Judah. They started praising and worshiping their God. And guess what happened in the middle of the night? God moved heaven and earth for them. You have a God that will move earth for you and quake earth and... Earthquake happened and everything, all, all, the, all the irons came off, all the doors opened up. And they were serving the God who is the earth-shaking God. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. They had a new song. They had praise and worship material. Daniel had praise and worship material. So this is how God keeps reintroducing himself to us in new and mighty ways. He's just giving you worship material. Say what I'm going through. I'll get through. It's going to be worship material. So you start telling the enemy in the fight you're in or whatever you're facing right now, I'm getting worship material, buddy. I'm getting worship material, buddy. I'm getting worship material, buddy. That's right. That's right. Hallelujah. So I want to define worship in practical terms. Worship is only reserved for the Lord. Worship is only reserved for the Lord. And that's the key to worship. Jesus is Lord. That's the key to worship. Jesus is Lord. The word Lord means owner. That's what it means. Legitimate owner. The one who legally owns it. Have you ever rented from a landlord? Yeah, legitimate. The word in the Bible also means high, my, high and mighty owner and controller. High, mighty owner and controller. That's why we call him the Lord God Almighty. So the Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So the Lord owns everything in the earth. He did not give Adam ownership. He gave him stewardship. The Lord still owns the earth. The Lord still owns the earth. The Lord still owns the earth. Owns the earth. Owns the earth. So everybody freaking about what's happened on the earth. The Lord still owns the earth and it's in his hand. See, the earth belongs to my God. So worship is the acknowledgement and the ascribing of all things to the source. The owner. Lord God controller. The owner. So the Lord owns everything because he's the legitimate or source of everything. He created everything, right? So if I, he created the earth, he has the patent on the earth. If he created the earth, he has the patent on the earth. So true worship is the result of the revelation of the source of creation. True worship begins as a result of the revelation of the source of creation. I'll say it till you get it. True worship is the result of the revelation of the source of creation. Wow. Until you get this, you'll struggle with worship all the days of your life. 
because you'll be taking for granted all the good and perfect gifts God has given you by the thousands, and you won't even realize and acknowledge with gratitude unto God with thankfulness to Him for them. So true worship is a result of a revelation that you have that Jesus Christ is the source and created everything. And when you get into that understanding and praised and continually on your lips, because you understand God owns it, but he's letting me use it. Amen. God owns it, but he's letting me use it. Amen. Any of you have hot water this morning when you showered? Yes. Please tell me you showered. <laughs> Well, the gas that heated that water came out of the earth that God formed and God made. You have hot water because of what God put in this earth. You have water because of what God put in this earth. Now, I'm going to freak you gals out, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Now, I'm going to get into it right now. How many of you gals got lipstick on? Mm, I'm going to mess with you now. I <laughs> got you. Do you know what it's made of? Animal parts and byproducts. That's what it's made out of. All your lipstick and makeup, guess what? <laughs> Ooh. Every bit of those things that they use in lipstick and makeup, ladies, came from God. Amen. He owns a cattle and a cattle on a thousand hills, the Bible says. Amen. And if you know what rendering is... And I'll never forget years ago, we had to take some mineral oil down to Phoenix and for, for the electric company. And we, we took it down there. We got to the place. We called, called up the office and said, you send us to the wrong place. We're at Revlon. And they said, no, you're at the right place. I said, well, what are we going to do with this? So we took it in there and we said, well, we got, we got mineral oil. And he says, come on, that's what, that's, that's what we make all this stuff out of. And he said, see that truck over there? That, he said, that, that, that is grease from all the restaurants in Phoenix. <laughs> He said, see that truck over there? He said, that's full of pig fat. And now I'm messing with you ladies, ain't I? <laughs> but every bit of makeup you have on, God's the source. That's right. That's right. And you put it on your lips that God is the source of that. And you won't even acknowledge, oh, don't worry, man, I got some for you, man. When I go fishing in the wintertime, uh, sometimes I end up with really, really chapped lips. And there's only one thing that really just absolutely just takes care of it instantly. It's called Carmex. And it's not lipstick, but I'm telling you, it's a healing balm. This is my wife's Revlon. Travel exclusive. The nudes. What are you wearing, baby girl? My goodness. Wow. <laughs> Revlon. So it has to do with the color? Do you even know that the pigment that they put in that stuff came from the earth? And God's saying, the lipstick you'll put on your lips, you won't use those same lips to praise me. Because all the lipstick that you're putting on, I came from it. I'm, it came from me. I'm the source of it. It came from the animals I created. And the colors came from the pigment I put in the earth. And Pastor Steve, when, when your lips are chapped, he has some lip balm here. And guess what? None of this stuff came from outer space. <laughs> Aliens didn't bring it. It came from what God created. And the lipstick, the, not lipstick, but this lip balm I use to heal my lips, I won't give God praise with these lips for the stuff that he put in the earth to help heal my... So now you understand, lady, where your make makeup comes from. Big fat. And <laughs> assorted other things. So true worship is the result. I didn't hear that one. I'm just going to go on. <laughs> and the revelation that you have of who is the source of everything that is created. And then when that gets into you, you understand it. Everything. Every good and perfect gift. Every say, every good and perfect gift. has come from your Father in heaven. My goodness. I understand who owns it. And he lets me use it. He's not even mad about it. In fact, he loves the fact that I enjoy it and I give him gratitude for it. He loves that fact. He's given me worship material all day long. So that means the lipstick you're putting on, it belongs to the owner. Chapstick I put on, it belongs to the owner. He said, I'm letting you use that. 
And when we use what God has given us and we can't say thank you, there's a lack of gratitude based in a wrong attitude and understanding. So when we ask you to stand up, we're not asking you to stand because we're trying to excite you and get you going. We're asking you to acknowledge the king. Amen. You need to stand up and, and that God has now given you muscle tight to sinew you and tendon and, and bone. And now you can stand up and your muscles can hold you up that God has given you. Your tendons can hold you up that are attached to bone that God has given you. And you won't stand up and just say, hey, thank you, Lord. Amen. How many of you are going to go have lunch after, after service today? Three of you? Four of you? Where, is our food pantry got anything back there in it, Bob? We got some people that got no food. Everything you're about to eat came from God. Amen. Everything, every piece of corn you're about to eat came from the hand of God. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Why do you think we pray and ask God to bless the food? We're giving Him thanks. We're giving Him honor. Everything belongs to God. And what happens is when I begin to understand that, now I live in an attitude of praise and worship. Amen. Lord, I put this shirt on today. I thank you for the cotton that you grew in this earth. And it actually came from your hand. And this shirt now that I'm wearing on, it came from the hand of God because it came from the source. And Jesus Christ is the source of this shirt. Yes. Jesus Christ is the source of the chair you're sitting on. There's a very famous saying in mining, if it doesn't grow, it has to come out of the ground. Everything on earth either grows or comes out of the ground, and God put it here. And when you begin to live in a cognizant awareness that every blessing I have is from God. So when I pull up to the tank, quit complaining about gasoline. Praise God, there is gasoline there. Praise God, there is gasoline. Praise God, there is gasoline. Quit complaining about the price. Thank God there's gasoline. When you get in that car, it's coming out of steel and iron that was taken out of the ground. And God said, I'm going to let you ride to, car, ride to church in a car, in an air-conditioned car at that. And you're complaining about service going too long. God says, I got news for you. Thank God for the car that got you here. Amen. I know places in the world in the Philippines where they walk to church every Sunday. And now as I begin to live in this cognizant relationship with God, now my praise is continual. Thank you, Lord, for my eyes, because I can see. Thank you, Lord, for my ears, because I can hear you. Thank you, Lord, for my hands, because I can work, and the work of my hands will be blessed. Thank you, Lord, for these clothes. You don't want to see me without clothes. Thank you, Lord, for this haircut. Thank you, Lord. My wife, my barber, she's the best barber I've ever had. Thank you, Lord, for this car. Thank you, Lord, for this house. Thank you, Lord, for this job. Thank you, Lord, for these kids. Thank and you begin to live in an absolute cognizant awareness that everything you have is by the hand of God. And praise is easy, and praise is worship, because you realize everything I have that's good is God. Everything that I have perfect is from God. Wow. Now I can understand praise the Lord continually. Now I understand it's not as hard as I thought it was. You don't need praise and worship cheerleaders to get you worshiping God. You can start worshiping Him at the grocery store. Thank you, Lord, for this abundance of food. I remember a friend of mine, he came from, he came from Yugoslavia. First time he went into a grocery store in America, he wept. He wept. He said, I've never seen anything like that, that much food in my life in one place. He didn't know it, believe, he didn't even know what happened. He said, my brother told me about it 10 years ago, but I told him, there's no place on earth that has food like that. Do you miss a chance to thank God for every good and perfect gift he gives you, minute by minute, day by day? Here's one, the breath you just took, that's in the hand of God. I, I hate to tell you this, but the breath you just took, thank you, Lord, for that breath. It's in the hand of God. So thank God your lips are working. My tongue is working, it's talking. My eyes are working, I can see. My ears, praise God, I can hear. And praise becomes continual. Because you see God in everything. In every aspect of your life. So ladies, when you put on your makeup tomorrow morning, I want you to start thanking God for that makeup. It came from Him. You put that lipstick on, Honey, it came from him. I want to hear praise and worship tomorrow when this is going on. <laughs> we understand it's a process. Guys, we don't do much. But you can thank God for the clothes you're wearing. If you have chapped lips, I thank God for the lip balm. And so now you understand worship isn't something we just run down here and do on Sunday. Continually. Continually because I'm aware of my source. I'm aware of the source of everything I have that is good is God. Everything you have that is good is God. 
And so now I worship him anywhere I am. Yes. You can worship God anywhere. Yes. How, how many of you are worshiping God for the rain we had this year? Yes. I am. I am. I know a place where some trees were dying and this rain came this year. And those trees right now look like they're amazing. Because they know who their source is. And let the trees of the field clap their hands and now they're clapping God. Every time the wind blows, they're just waving their hands. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Randy, how much rain you got? 22 inches? Over 22 inches. Over 22 inches, praise God. So why, why, why don't we live in this aspect, this cognizant understanding? Continually, cognizantly aware. The Bible tells us to. The Bible, it encourages us to. In fact, it exhorts us to live in this understanding. Every good and perfect gift. This is Jesus' half-brother. He grew up with Jesus. He knew a little bit about the heart of Jesus Christ, the Savior. Amen. This is his brother. James' brother was Mary, the same lady that birthed Jesus Christ. He grew up in a home understanding who God was. When you get a revelation of Jesus Christ as the source of all things, and you have this consciousness of gratitude... You begin to praise God for every little thing coming along and everything you have. And you begin to thank Him for little things. You begin to thank Him for everything. And the enemy can't get in edgewise because all you're doing is praising God because you don't have no time to grumble. Because all you're doing is praising continually. Praising continually. And the devil's trying to get in and you're like, there's no room here, buddy. I'm in a worship service. And I found out he don't attend worship services. He hates them. How many have a car? Say thank you, Jesus. How many have a roof over your head? Thank you, Jesus. How many have food to eat? Thank you, Jesus. How many have gas for the car that God gave you? Thank you, Jesus. Oh, my goodness. Last week, last couple weeks, when he flew back to see my son, I realized, man, God, God, God made this aluminum, lightweight aluminum, so you could have planes to fly. And something that would take 24 hours to drive, we could fly in three hours. I got up in Nashville one on uh, from Franklin one day, and I was in show that evening. My goodness, God is good to us. One thing I, my wife told me, she said, I want to live where there's a paved road. <laughs> She grew up on a farm, and, and uh, her whole house and her whole life was dust, dust, dust. Anybody grow up on a dirt road? <laughs> Still on one, huh? My, I lived on a dirt road all my life. My mother, bless her, how she, she finally she just quit trying. It just wasn't worth it. So this is why James now says, every good and perfect gift is from God. And he says this, with whom there was no variation of turning. God says, I won't give it to you and then take it away from you. I'm not fickle. God is not fickle. God is not fickle. One of my scriptures that I have a hard time with is he reigns on the just and the unjust too. I pray for rain and rains on my sinful neighbor. Are you kidding me, God? Come on. We just rain on my house and let him figure it out him own. But true worship begins with a revelation that you get and understand that you know the source of everything in your life that is good and perfect. And you will begin to be worshiping God at a whole new level. You'll be worshiping God all day long. You'll be worshiping God. Thank you, God, for this job. Thank you, God, for this boss. I thank you, God, for this situation. I thank you, Lord, for clothes on my back. I thank you, Father, for my kids. I thank you for my dog. I thank you, Father, for my neighbor. I thank you, Lord, for this house. I thank you for this car. I thank you for these paved roads. You'll begin to have an understanding of everything that's good is God. Amen. And your praise and worship will never stop, and it will be continuing to the Lord. So when you understand where it all comes from, you don't need cheerleaders for worship leaders. You are your own worship leader because you're writing your own song. I'm praising God all day long. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Amen. Praising my Savior all the day long. That's true worship. That's true worship, praising your Savior all the day long. Knowing what He has done for you. That's worship. So your life is a perpetual life of thanksgiving and gratitude. Because you know the source of all good things. If you agree with me, say amen. amen. Stand up with me for the blessing.
So now you understand the heart of a worshiper is acknowledging God in everything. One of my favorite movies is The Count of Monte Cristo. And she tells him, don't you know God is in everything? Can't you see him? And he said, can I escape from your God? And she said, no. You can't escape from the goodness of God. You may not thank him for it, but you can't escape it. Father, today we just ask, anoint this word. Let it be the living word of God. Let our hearts become just a theater of praise and worship. Thanking you. Thanking you for the precious gift of Jesus Christ. And everything that comes with it. Forget not the Lord and all his benefits, David said. David said, I get it. David said, I get it. Forget not the Lord and all his benefits. So here's one. The Lord bless you and keep you. Think about that. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord of creation. The Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance on you and give you his peace. Yes. And the Lord told Israel, you put my name on your children. Amen. I'm a God of covenant. Yes. If you and I are in covenant, I'm after your kids. You, I'll seek them. Because I'm in covenant with you. You got scripture for that? Yeah, I do. The God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Manasseh, Ephraim, David, Solomon, Jesus Christ himself. So receive this, I pray, in Jesus' name. And I want you praising God for every good thing you have this week. I want you understanding you don't have to come to church to praise and worship God. You can live in a place in an attitude of praise and continually worshiping your God. God bless you. You're dismissed. Hello, one and all. We have been receiving questions regarding where to send tithes and offerings. If you'd like to mail it in, you can do so at P.O. Box 2223, Sholo, Arizona, 85902. And please, if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, share, and subscribe. While you're at it, like us on Facebook, link is in the description, and follow us on Instagram and Twitter, link is also in the description. Helps out us, helps out the channel, and most importantly, shows that this is a format you wish to see continue. And with that, we wish you a blessed week.